Without data from him, we wouldn't have research. So. Are you looking forward to the twenty-five dollars? I under, I, I understand. Hi everybody, welcome. Uh, I wanted to tell y'all know that we are live streaming this presentation, but I want to introduce Dr. Kavasis to Bella real quick. He's actually my cousin, so I'm very proud to be up here presenting him to you all on um, his topic. And he is an associate dean for research and graduate programs and a director for Center of Teaching Excellence. Take it away. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome um, to the people in the room and also to the people remotely. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here. So, like Ms. Vela said, that's who I am. Have multiple roles, but um, I think the most important role for me today is um, I'm also a parent, so I can relate to 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 all of you. So I'm here talking um, talking with you, right? Um, so. The title of today is how to how to deal with depression and and increase happiness. That's that's hopefully what we'll go over today. So I always like to start with a little bit, not too much about who the facilitator is. Um, and you'll have to excuse me. I have a water bottle. I'm recovering from a cold. Just went to the doctor for the second time, so I'm praying my cough will will behave. Otherwise, it's going to be quite. Um, Annoying, but um, a little bit about who, who I am. And you notice I have facilitator because I really don't see myself as a presenter, um, as a speaker, as an expert. I just want to throw things at you to get you thinking about things. I'm certainly not an expert. The things we're gonna talk about today are hard, they're not easy, so I'm with you in this, in this battle for ourselves and for our children. But I do have strong ties to, to Harlingen CIST. Um, like I said, I was a little sick, so I didn't wear this shirt intentionally, but it's fitting, right? Um, but that, that, the Vela Middle School is named after my, my late um, grandfather. Um, Ms. Vela is my cousin, her father, the CEO of Valley Baptist in Harlingen. So my ties to Harlingen are, are deep. I love Harlingen. I, I, I live and work in Edinburgh right now at UT Rio Grande Valley. But every time I get a chance to come back, I, I do. Um, Harlingen is very close, close to my heart. And this right here is, 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 is my daughter. And I think that's where I can connect with you all. My daughter, I heard some people say your kids are always be young, right, college age. My daughter's three and a half. Um, the rest of you, you probably have somewhere in, in that range. But that, that's, that's my motivation today. Even though I'm sick, I wanna talk with you all about a very important issue for our kids because my daughter at some point will become sad and, and depressed, not if, I would argue when, and it's important that we know how to, how to help them. So that, that's why I'm here, that's my motivation, um, my daughter, and I, I'm sure that's why y'all are here too. And before we start, I wanna say, I was talking with Ms. Vela earlier, um, and I can say this openly, at the university, in one of my roles, I facilitate workshops like this for professors to become better teachers. And for whatever reason right now, attendance has been a little low in late March. Um, so I wanna tell y'all thank you for, for being here feeling right now. <laughs> I, I, I assure you that. All right, so the two objectives. Um, if there's anything I've learned about teaching is when we teach, we should have objectives. That way we know that at the end of the conversation or workshop, we know did we meet some objectives. So there's two, right? The first one is identify characteristics of depression. And the second one, recognize strategies to increase positive, positive emotions. So it would be very depressing and very sad to have an hour and a half conversation on depression, which a lot of people do. They focus on what's wrong, why are people sad? But the last 30 minutes, half of it, we're gonna have a conversation on how to increase happiness, how to increase positive emotions. And that's where I'm coming from with that angle. Because I've learned those conversations are more important than figuring out what makes people sad. We need to figure out what makes people happy. Okay? So, I, I'm, um, when I used to teach more, I used to, I used to lecture a lot. Actually, I lectured quite a bit. I would read from a PowerPoint for two hours and a half, and at the end I would ask my audience, which were students, did, you, did they have any questions? I've since learned that's not the best pedagogical tool 
the best pedagogical tool is more interaction, more reflection. I can't do a lot of that today because we have people online. And it wouldn't be fair to get you all in here talking with each other and then the people online, what, what would they do, right? So what I, I try to do is every 15, 20 minutes in this conversation, I try to put a slide where I ask you all to think, to reflect about the question on the screen. So this first question, I want you to think about 30 seconds. And Ms. Bella will tell me when 30 seconds are up. What are symptoms of depression? What is depression? Just 30 seconds. Nobody needs to blur out the answer. I'm not going to call on anybody. But just I want you to think, what is depression or what are symptoms of depression? So one of the reasons I do that is because like I mentioned in the beginning, and I truly believe that, I'm not just saying that, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this topic. I'm really not. A lot of you, and I would probably say, all of you have experiences with depression. I want to activate your prior knowledge with this question. I want to know, what do you know about depression? What do you, what do you think it is? What does it look like? That way, on these next slides, you can integrate what depression is into what you think you know about it, right? That's where I'm coming from. So what is depression? And we'll get to that in just a minute, but I always like to start with why depression is important. Now I'm gonna integrate some jokes throughout uh, because I know it's 610. I know it's been a long day for a lot of you. Um, I mentioned who my family was and their role in Harlingen um, law and education. Uh, my grandmother, she's not here so I can say this, right? My grandma is a wonderful woman. She goes to HEB tw about twice a week, and she always buys one magazine every time, twice a week. She always buys the National Enquirer or the Star, right? If you don't know what the National Enquirer is, it's a magazine eh, that maybe not, doesn't have the most reliable information. I say maybe, right, because she argues that it does. But I'm coming from, I'm, I'm here presenting to Harlan CISD to my cousin, to the superintendent, right? I gotta promote uh, what I know reliable, at least magazines. So next to the Star or National Enquirer, HEB, there's Time Magazine. Well, I would say very reputable. Year and a half, year and a half ago, this was the headline. Anxiety, depression, and the modern adolescent. When I saw that headline in, on Time, that caught my attention. This tells me that our children are going through something very significant. This tells me that this is a serious problem. This also tells me that this is a serious issue. And I say our children because my daughter's three. This is our problem. We can no longer think that depression is not going to affect our children because it will. We know that approximately 65% of high school students today say depression and anxiety is a serious problem. So our kids are acknowledging this. But I mentioned that with my grandmother because if I put the National Enquirer and I said, oh, National Enquirer is talking about adolescent depression, some of you probably wouldn't have believed that. But now that Time Magazine has it on their cover, this tells us that we need to pay attention to it. We need to look into it a little further. So what is it? What is depression? All of you had something in mind. My guess is some of you probably said mm, tears, sadness. And you're absolutely right. The number one thing, number one symptom of depression is a depressed mood. What does that look like? It could be tears. It could be somebody lying in bed. Somebody who's sad. That to me, that image on the right, that to me looks like somebody who's a little sad. Somebody who has this look that they're here physically, but psychologically they're not here. Which reminds me a lot of my students in my classes. Though I shouldn't say it. I'm just playing. Just kidding. Just kidding. So that's the first one, that's the first one, right? The second one, diminished interest or pleasure in activities. Oh, what does that mean? This is what that looks like. Let's say you're a child, middle school. Every weekend always wants to go play basketball with the same group of kids. One weekend, he or she doesn't want to play basketball. All right, fine, maybe something came up, maybe they don't feel well. But if your kid doesn't play basketball for three consecutive weeks, 
maybe there's a problem. Maybe they're a little sad because we know people who are sad, they stop doing things that they enjoy doing. When people are sad, they want to be alone, they want to be isolated. So the point of this is if your kid is a little sad or looks sad and they stop having interest in some of the activities they enjoy doing, there's something that could be potentially, potentially wrong. These two, huge ones. And this is the one where we tend to overlook. And they make sense, but sometimes when we think of depression, we only think of the tears, the sadness. But these two, I promise you, they'll make sense once we talk about them. The one on the left, this is a picture of a, a I don't know her, her age, but a, a woman, I'll call her a young woman, in bed sleeping. We know a huge symptom of depression is sleep. Lots of sleep. And it makes sense. If you're sad, you don't want to see a lot of people. You don't want to see anybody. You don't want to do anything. You want to stay in bed sleeping. Now, some people might, argue, might say, well, sleep is a good thing. Yes, of course it is. Absolutely. But the number we're looking for here is 14 days. 14 days of five or more of these symptoms we're talking about that leads to a, a, a depression diagnosis. So let's say after the end of a long week, your, your child on a Saturday sleeps 14 hours. You might say, oh, this, this, this presenter said my kid's depressed. No, 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 that's not what I said. If they're sleeping for like long periods of time for 14 or more days, then there's a significant problem. That's what we're talking about here with sleep. And the one on the right, you see a picture of a scale. This can go both ways, and I was reminded of this about three weeks ago at another conversation. Most people, I said most people, when they're depressed, they lose a, a significant amount of weight in a short amount of time. And think about it, it makes sense. If somebody's sad, if somebody's in bed, they don't want to eat, they don't want to do anything, so they lose an excessive amount of weight. I've had two, what I would call, and what the, the field will call, I've had two depressive episodes in my life. Now, I've kind of gone in the opposite direction, but when I was sad and depressed, I lost 13 pounds in a period of six days. I literally could not eat, I didn't want to eat, it was very hard to, to, to eat for me. That's how it hit me physically. But we also know how the media portrays this. Usually, I said usually, right? Usually, when we see a movie and there's a breakup involved, we see a young woman, sad, crying, who's on her way to the refrigerator getting a bowl or a gallon of ice cream, right? Because that, that stereotype comes from this idea that some people, when they get depressed, will go the other end and have an an excessive amount of weight gain when they get depressed. So the point of all this is this. We know that depression is normal. Sadness is normal. If, you, if your kid loses a grandparent, that's a normal, it's going to be normal for him or her to be sad. Absolutely. I would hope they're sad. It's going to show that they cared about their grandparents. What we're talking about is if these symptoms persist for 14 or more days, then there becomes an issue, possibly an issue, with, with depression. That's where we're coming from with, with, with that. No, that's nice. I have two slides uh, on, on the scale. Not sure why I had that. So, you see this image up here. And maybe for the, the first 15 minutes, I, I hope this, this one hits you. I promise you, it hits me every time. Regardless of how my day is gone, how happy I am, this one always hits me hard. I'm um, a big fan of sports. I love sports. College sports, professional sports, everything. Right now I'm watching college basketball, March Madness. So I have this image, and I promise you this image is connected to depression in a very, very real and very sad, sad way. I have this image of a young man. He was the quarterback at Washington State University. Washington State, big time college football program, big time money. I look at this image with my background in sports, I would say this, this young man is happy, he has the world by his tail. Unfortunately, he committed suicide about a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, this, this young man starting quarterback at a big time school. And I say that here because 
I don't, I don't know how else to say this, but that's what depression can, can result in. Not, it's not cause and effect. No, I'm not up here saying if our children get depressed, they will commit or attempt suicide. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying here is we know depression is a big indicator of potential suicide attempts. That's what we're saying here. We're saying here that suicide, which is, as a parent, the worst nightmare, right? That doesn't even describe what that situation is like. We're saying that if our kids are depressed for an extended period of time, this is something that, 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 that could be the result of that. So with that said, not everybody agrees with me on this one, but just hear me out on this. On this. Growing up, there was this, what I would perceive uh, to, to, to be a myth about, about suicide. Growing up, I was taught, and even with my family, I was taught, you can't talk about suicide because that's going to give people ideas. That's going to put ideas in their mind. As I've read more literature, as I've got more training, I've learned, and not everybody agrees with this, I've learned that that's actually a myth. Asking our kids if they want to harm themselves is actually a good thing because it gives them space to talk about it. And to give you a real example, and I'm just going to be very real and honest. You know, I'm not trying to hide anything here. I, I, about a year, a year, year and a half ago, I lost my grandfather. Um, last nine months ago, I lost my mom. I lost my mom. And I don't talk to my father anymore. So those are my two people. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't know how to say this. My grandmother point blank asked me, "Are you gonna? Are you thinking about harming yourself?" That's what she asked me. Those were the words out of her mouth. She, she wasn't trying to give me ideas. She was just trying to create space to see where I was at, how I, how I was feeling. So I promise you, and I'm here looking at all of you in the eye and the people online, when my daughter gets to that point, and notice I'm not saying if, I'm saying when. Middle school, probably. And elementary is still too young. Maybe middle school. If I sense that she has five of these symptoms and she's been depressed for, not, not 14, but a little more than that, I will ask questions like, have you thought about harming yourself? I will ask those questions because I'm not giving her ideas. I'm giving her space to talk about it. So as parents, that's your call, right? But as a licensed professional counselor, that's what I'm trained to do. I have to ask that question. But as a parent, I will ask that because I know that it creates space for that conversation. And if you've never said those words coming out of your mouth, I encourage you tonight to just practice it. it. It's rough. It is rough to ask somebody that. It is not easy. But I would tell you that I know you all love your children and you'll do everything to protect them. And this is, this is a serious issue um, that, that, could, that could come from that. So I know this is, this is heavy stuff. I know this is, this is sad stuff. Whenever I see his image, of course it's natural. I think of my daughter. Brutal. I, I can't even imagine how the parents feel. And nobody's blaming him, nobody's blaming the parents. We're just creating space for, for these conversations of what this could look like. Another red flag, and I know this is, this is getting even more depressing and depressing. I promise you the last part will be on happiness. This is a, this is a quote in terms of a red flag of children or adolescents who, who might be very depressed. And this is in quotes, I don't want to be here anymore. You know, that's tough to hear from a, from a 14, from a 15-year-old. And as parents, that's when we need to follow up. What, what do you mean? What do you mean? Is here meaning I don't want to be in Harlingen, says D? No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. It's, it's trying to make light of a serious issue. But what this could mean from adolescence is here in life. I don't want to be here in life anymore. And that's where we need to follow up with them um, in terms of that. So I think this is the last slide before we move on to, to happiness. So, so two things here. Those of you who are from Harlingen, you probably at least are familiar with my late grandfather, Moises Vela. You know, very successful, prominent attorney, judge. They named the school after him. Love that man. I miss him every day. And I promise you, out of all the people I've met in the world, and I'm not saying this just because he's my grandfather. He's the closest to perfection that uh, I've met, in my humble opinion. However, having said that, and 
don't, don't tell my grandmother this because she doesn't like hearing it, but it's the truth. He had this mentality about mental health, at least to me, in terms of being tough. Don't talk about your problems with other people. Toughen up, be a man, be, be, be macho. That, that was his idea to me. And I'm not knocking that, I'm not. But what I'm trying to do is create space for the other perspective, which is this up here, the image, that it's okay not to be okay that if our kids are crying or sad, instead of telling them toughen up, don't cry, we need to tell them that's okay. We need to give them space to express their emotions. And I guess I'm here telling you that growing up, that wasn't the message that was, was, was portrayed to me. And I used that message and I would, I would make fun of mental health and I'm, I'm being very honest. Brianna, Ms. Bella's cousins, and I didn't share this the last time, but I feel important to share it because it helps you understand how far I've come with mental health. Brianna's cousins were like my brothers. They're my best men in my wedding. And when they were in fifth and sixth grade, I, I used to tease them. I used to tell them that if they weren't okay, they needed to go see their school counselor which meant that I, I, was, I thought they were crazy, right? That's, that, that's how I was making fun of it. Never did I tell them, if you're not okay, that's okay. Never did I say that growing up. It wasn't until my education training that I realized how flawed and wrong I was. Imagine how they felt as adolescents. If they ever felt, and I'm just thinking about this right now, it's, it's horrible how, what I did. If they thought, what if I need to go see a counselor? My cousin, who they looked up to, thinks that that's crazy. That's the message I portrayed, which is completely different to what I'm sharing now. That if our kids are sad and they go see a counselor, that's a positive thing. That's a good thing because it shows they're aware of how they're feeling. And last point on this, and I'm not the best at this, and I'll be very honest and transparent with all of you that some of these things I struggle with every day to, to do them. But I think right now in the mental health world, if we get people to go to counseling, that's a great thing. But sometimes people don't go to a counselor until there's something wrong, until there's something seriously wrong. So the message I'm saying is, let's say your kids, everything's okay. Why can't we go to a counselor or do some of these things we're going to talk about tonight to become better? Why can't we go from a five, on a scale from one to ten in happiness? Let's say some of us are a five. Why can't we do things to help us go to a six? I think a lot of people, at least in terms of mental health, they wait till they're feeling like a three or a two, and then they go seek help. So the message I'm promoting here with probably your son's research is aligned to that too, is why can't we go from being okay to even better? All right, so right on track. You know, in, my, uh, in my graduate classes, I've learned that people's attention span, it's about 15 to 20 minutes, and we need like a, a, mental, and a mental break, right? So one minute, just one minute, whether you're here or online, just think about, What's your personal connection to, to depression? Did you know somebody? Do you know somebody? Are you here for your kids? I, I have that as a little puzzle, right? What's your connection to this stuff? Ms. Vela, in one minute, tell me. Okay, so one minute. So if we, <clears throat> if we were all here in the room, or if this is my graduate class, 
we, you know, we write a little bit on this, we talk about it, we process it, but given the, the online circumstances, I felt this is the best option, just giving you a chance to think about it. But whatever, whatever your connection is, whatever reason you're here, you know, once again, I appreciate you being here, because this connection to the topic is what is going to motivate you and keep you engaged to the, to the last part, which are the strategies. I've shared with you some of my connections. My biggest connection is, is my daughter. And all of you, I, I bet all of you have kids. My biggest connection is, is my daughter. She's three and a half, and I want to continue talking about these things. Um, so one day, that when she does get sad or, or sick, um, that we find resources to help her, okay? So here's another one, just, just 20 seconds. This is the happiness part. You see the nice little image of, of, of Scrabble, right? Happiness. I promise you, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but a lot of people focus on depression more often than not. A lot of these workshops focus on depression, depression, depression. Well, what about, what about happiness? Imagine love Brianna and her, and her husband right in the news. Love that, everything. But sometimes, not 23, not NBC 23, but sometimes the news, it's a little negative. It's negative, negative, negative. It's not until we get to the weather some days that we talk about happiness. I think a lot of media and society train us to think about what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong. Another example, I know we're recording. I know a lot of things I'm saying could get me in trouble, but I'm being honest and transparent with you all. And here's the best example of what that looks like. This is a true story. And then we'll talk about the strategies. So last November, I was scheduled to, to present, and I don't like using the word present, lead a conversation with Harlingen CISD at their family, their, their family day, mid-November. So my wife and I were at South Padre Island. This is a true story. The night before the presentation, I stayed over there, then I was gonna drive over here to Harlingen Saturday morning. The last image she shared with me before I went to bed was something from her Facebook page. The image was of a young girl in a foreign country who had passed away due to starvation. That is what was on her Facebook page. That is what she communicated to me and that, is what, that was the last thought I had before I went to sleep. I am not blaming her. That is an example of how the world helps us look at the negative a lot of the time. And that's fine. I'm not here telling us to ignore the negative. I'm just here asking us to bring the positive into the conversation. After that image, she didn't share another image of something a little happier. That's what she left me with. And that's what a lot of us are left with. So if your children or you are going through something severe, I'm not saying ignore that. I'm just saying let's bring other things into the conversation. Yeah, I know if she watches this video, I'm gonna be in trouble, but that's all right. It's okay, because I wanna be transparent with y'all, because this is, this, is, this is real. All right, so last part of this. I appreciate all, the, all your attention so far. Super cool, super, super cool. So you see this image here. You see a lot of, um, I mean, I, I haven't counted this, all the faces, it looks like maybe 11 or 12 negative, sad, sad faces. That's what the world trains us to look at. I'm asking you to think about that one yellow smiley face. I'm asking you to help your kids think about that. And I'm also telling you that these next eight things, which I'll call strategies, even though they sound cookie cutter, are based on solid, solid science and research. And I'm here telling you that these next eight things are not easy to do. I'm not here telling you I do these things every night. I do not. I try to, but some days are, are very challenging. How am I gonna tell you when you go to bed to, to focus on the positive, be happy, when sometimes our children are not behaving right before bed? Or how do you want to look on the bright side when you can't get your daughter into the car seat when she looks like she's going to take off to the moon, right? How do you do that? How do you do those things? We do that by at least trying to remember that some of these things 
are very, very important to, to help us move toward happiness. And there's eight of them. So my hope is that at least one of these will connect with you or, or your kids. That's my hope. So number eight. And again, they're in no particular order. But number eight is this. How many, at least in here, how many of you have ever lost somebody? Raise your hand if you've lost somebody. Yes, right? And my hunch is your kids, maybe a grandparent, maybe, I don't know, a sibling, some, some, somebody. I can tell you, I didn't lose somebody close to me until I was in college, until I was 20 years old when my late godfather passed away. And that's, I, I'm very lucky, right? I'm very blessed. But number eight is this. Celebrate your lost loved ones. That, that makes sense, right? It sounds so easy. What I don't want this to become is, I lost my mom in May. I wouldn't, somebody to, I wouldn't want somebody to come to the funeral and tell me, oh, you need to find a way to celebrate her. No, I need time to grieve. I need space. So when you or your loved ones are ready to talk about this, we know through research that celebrating them is very important, very meaningful. What I'm saying is, when you're, when you're ready emotionally to move toward that, what does that look like? It can be as easy as putting a picture um, uh, in, in your house, making it visible, wearing a little pennant, which, 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 which I do. But I don't like when people make this sound so easy because it's not. Some people aren't ready to put a photo or other remembrance of the lost loved one. So when you're ready, or your kid is ready, we know that celebrating that our lost loved ones is very important to our happiness. And you see this picture, I love this picture, right? You see her, you notice her in the background, right? I love this picture because the younger generation, the millennial, is trying to take a selfie, and the older generation is trying to talk on the phone, and he was not very happy, right? But I have this image because my way of celebrating my grandfather is, is by wearing a little necklace that he gave me, um, or my grandma gave me, that he wore in the Korean War in 1951. Now, that was my way. But I, I couldn't put it on until, until I was ready. So I'm not here saying, oh yeah, celebrate your lost loved ones. No, celebrate when you're ready, when you feel comfortable. Number seven, this is where people get upset with me. They say, how are you gonna, how are you gonna quote Dr. Seuss? And I'll tell you why. So, so when your kids, this might be more relevant to you all right now, but the, the rest of you, if you have younger kids, and I'm very intentional in my language, I'm not saying if, I'm saying when. When your kids graduate from college, I hope that they'll, they'll participate in the, in the ceremony. I hope they'll walk. That's what I'm saying. And here's the honest truth. As a faculty member at a university, we're encouraged to go to the graduation to support the graduates, to support the students. Sometimes we don't pay attention to <laughs> some of the things that are going on. There's always a commencement speech, which means they invite a speaker to give words of wisdom to the graduates. I heard this quote one time at a ceremony, and it didn't hit me because I probably wasn't paying attention as much as I should have. It wasn't until the second time I heard it. This is a, a speaker who the university invited because they felt he or she was worthy of giving, giving a commencement address. So the second time I heard it, I really tried to process what it meant and it really stuck to me. And here's what it says. It says, don't cry because it's over, smile because it happened. I promise you, this quote can help you or our kids completely change how they're thinking. And here's what that looks like. When we lose somebody we're, who we love, days, weeks, even years, or months, we're in this mentality of, why aren't they here anymore? I wish they were here, I wish they were here. That's how, that's how I was when my mom passed away. Right? That's how I was. I was crying because she was no longer here. So when we're ready, and I want to stress that because I want to be sensitive to everybody, when we're ready, imagine moving from why am I going to cry that she's no longer here when I, sh I could smile because I got to spend 34 years of my life with her? It's a shift in how we think. That's all it is. 
But was I ready to have this thinking the day after she passed away, the day after she got put on hospice? No, absolutely not. So when, you, when we're ready, this, is the, the, this could be a way to think about, about things or think about life. I will say this though, and I want to be honest and transparent with you all. I, I recognize that this isn't simple in certain situations. Like I'll, I'll, be, I'll be real with y'all, if something ever happens to my daughter, I don't know if I'll ever get to this perspective. And I, I'm being real with you. Not everybody says that. There's people up here who talk, oh yeah, no matter what happens, I'll get to that point. No, I, I, I cannot say that. I, I really cannot. Um, look, I just read an article on CNN, about, and I don't know all the facts, about a father who apparently um, took, his, took his life, and he, his daughter was one of the ones who was killed in was it Sandy, Sandy Hook, right? I'm not, I, I hate bringing that up with this. I know the implication, but I'm here telling you, I would struggle to get to the point of smile because I got to experience my daughter for five or six years. I really am. So I want to be transparent with you all. In every other situation, I feel I can get to this point, except that. And really what this is telling us is just to think about how we're thinking about these things. I know that was really dark. Even for me, thinking about it, that was not fun. But I think it's important. All right, so moving right along. You know, this is, I, I know I'm, I'm lecturing, but I hope I'm engaging with you all enough that you're thinking about these things. Um, num number six, and look, I'm a product of Harlan CISD. I love Harlan CISD, so I'm not knocking anybody. Um, there was a particular, and I probably wasn't paying as much attention as I should have, so I should preface <laughs> this statement with that. But sometimes um, in school, we focus a lot on what we as students are doing wrong, which makes sense, right? We need to know where to improve. But sometimes we don't focus on what we're doing well or doing right. <clears throat> and this is a simple survey. If you have 12 minutes, and you could take this as parents or ask your kids to take, if you have 12 minutes, you could have them take what's called a values in action inventory. And what this is, it's a survey about people's strengths. It's a survey about creativity, resilience, gratitude, nature. People answer a set of questions about their strengths and they're given a report on what they're good at, and the idea is to help people cultivate that, do more of that. That's the idea. The idea behind this survey is that sometimes, and I don't even want to say students, sometimes people, we don't do some of the things we're good at every day. What does that look like? What does that look like? Here's what that looks like. I know it's a little small, right? So I, I never uh, talk about things if I haven't done them. So I did take this survey. I've taken it multiple times. 12 minutes. There are a lot of questions, right? But 12 minutes, and it gives you a report of your top five strengths in life. And this is gonna look clear right now. So mine are this, perseverance, gratitude, appreciation of beauty, curiosity, and humor. I know the humor y'all are very surprised about. That's all right, it's okay. That's why it's probably number five. But let's take number three. This is how that looks, this is how it looks. Number three is appreciation of beauty. That means that one of my strengths is that I like, I like nature, I like to admire things, I like to be outdoors, and I, I, like, um, I like nature. So if, if I was working with a counselor or my wife or grandma, somebody, my cousin, they would ask me a simple question. When's the last time you've done some of those things? That's it. And you know what, my answer would be, it's been a while, it's been a while. The reason this is important is because when people are sad or depressed, they stop doing the things they love or they stop doing the things they enjoy doing. That's what this means. So for your kids, if you help them take this survey, it's gonna give them a list of top five strengths. Your role as a parent is to ask them, how can you do more of this every day in your life? The one on creativity, I don't know, I don't know how that looks like because it wasn't one of mine, but let's say your child has number one creativity. 
How could you get them to express more of that every day, to cultivate that? That's what this looks like. My number two is gratitude, and we're going to end with that. And I, I promise it's, it's, it's interesting, but that's what that looks like. It involves 12 to 15 minutes. What's cool is that you as adults and parents can take it as well. Take it, reflect a little bit, and think about how, how much of this am I, am I doing? You know what, I don't practice counseling anymore. I'm fully licensed, doing other things. But when people used to come to me, a lot of people would um, think that I was the expert and tell them what to do. No, my role is, uh, they're the experts. My role is just to help them go back to the point when they were doing all these wonderful things. My first question was, when were you happy? When was the last time you were happy? And then I would ask them, how can we get you back to that place? How can we get you doing some of those things? And I promise you, some of their strengths weren't being as utilized. So, so far it goes so good. Five more. It's the home stretch. You know, you, you, you probably know it's a trend, you know, and the, I, I do some of these conversations every now and then, and it's never easy seeing my grandfather on the screen. It's never easy, so I want you all to be aware of that. Um, number five is connect with others. Sounds so simple. Well, imagine if your adolescent is depressed or sad. It's not simple. It's not. When we're depressed, we've already said we want to be isolated, we want to be alone, and we probably want to be in bed. Now, I always love when a parent mentions that how do you know if it's depression or normal adolescence? Because I can't wait when my daughter closes the door on my face when she's 14 or 15, right? And I'm smart enough to know that, that just because she's in a room doesn't mean she's depressed. I get that. But I also want us to think about all these other symptoms of depression. Just because your kid is in the room isolated doesn't mean they're depressed. And I think we know that, but just to recognize it. But let's say they are depressed. What we're saying here is it's vital to get them connected with people. I'll never forget, and I know I'm sharing a lot, <laughs> um, and I hope they're relevant for you all. In high school, I did some strange things, right? Um, my poor mom, I probably put her more through than what she needed to. So as parents, I applaud you for what you're doing with your children because I know it's not easy. In fact, I, I know it's very, very difficult. But there was a period where I did some strange things and I did some things that I shouldn't have with, with, the, with the law and just, just some things. But I'll never forget, after one night when I did things I shouldn't have, the following morning, I'll never forget what my mom did. She took me to Chili's and she connected me with some people who I needed to see, some of my friends and, a, and an ex and an ex-girlfriend. That is what she did. She helped me connect with others. And it was not easy um, getting me out of the house that day because I was sad, I was mad, I was embarrassed. But as a counselor, she knew that it was important to keep me connected. I've, I've learned, and I'm sure you can re relate to this, the hardest part of, of a death is when, is, it was, is when about four or five days after the funeral, when all the family and friends leave, right? Because that connection, that connection is, is lost. Um, so for our kids, I know it's hard, I know it's hard, it will be very important for us to help them stay connected. What that means is, it could be with you, with friends, with family, just somebody, something. We can't let them be, can't let them be isolated. Alright, and then number four, then we'll have a little, little, another little pause. That's my daughter, I think that was right before her third birthday, you know, believe it or not, she is, she is pretty humble. No, nah, she's three, right? How do you know if she's humble or not? <laughs> um, but that's a very extravagant dress. But the point of the slide is this. For you or your kid, we know from research that hope is the, one of the biggest protectors of, of depression and one of the biggest predictors of happiness. So for you all tonight, think about two questions. What does hope mean to you? And what gives you hope? That could be like, why do, you wake, why do you wake up in the morning? Today, 
was not easy. I, I've, I've been sick all weekend. But I always go back to my daughter, as I'm sure all of you go back to your children, right? But just keep hope at the front of your mind. But this is more challenging for our kids. Because when you're 16, and let's say you go through a breakup, you're not thinking about, oh, my hope is 16 years later, I'll have a family, kids in the house. You're not thinking that. You're thinking the world's going to end, right? So for you, as, for us as parents, it'll, it's vital that we help our kids think about, think about hope and what that could look like in the future. We have to keep them thinking about their future. I promise you, ask your kids, not a fifth grader, right? The 19-year-old, ask them, what, what gives you hope? What, what gives you hope in, in life? And we'll see what they, how they respond. All right. A little pause, right? A little pause. We have like 12 minutes left. There's three more. Three more. So the pause here is these first five strategies. Just think about, is there any, is there any one in particular that you think you could do or utilize? Okay, just 30 seconds. And if not, we still have three more. So hopefully one of them, right? 30 seconds. These, um, we, we sell people online, right? All right, cool. So these pauses, I, 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 know, I'm no, I know I'm the one doing it, but <laughs> I really love these pauses because I've been in presentations, and honestly, in college, some of my professors would never pause. They would just go straight through and, wow, it's fast, you know? So the pauses are designed to give, give us time to, to think, to reflect. And like I said, if we were just here face to face, we have a little extra couple minutes to, to write and to, to share. But I, I, I like them. So the last three, here are the last three. And these are, not, these are not easy, but they're very important. Acts of kindness. I'll never forget somebody asked me in front of a large group, and I appreciate it because I'm not an expert. They asked me, how are acts of kindness related to happiness and, and depression? <clears throat> and I let the audience kind of talk, and somebody said, somebody got the connection. When we're sad and depressed, we're only thinking about ourselves. We're alone in our bed, either eating nothing or eating a lot. Isolated, we're only thinking about ourselves. Some people might say it's a little selfish. That's a little harsh. I would say it's okay to have a little time to be sad. But the point is this. When we're sad, we're thinking about ourselves, our misery, what's causing us to be sad. We're not thinking about anybody else in this world. So acts of kindness takes us out of ourselves and make, helps us think about others. What could that look like? That could look like lots of different things. I love this image, somebody going out of their way with an umbrella to help somebody else who is struggling a little more not get wet from the rain. It could be as easy as that. It could be as easy as as going to McDonald's and paying for the person's coffee behind you. Right? We all know what's, what's happening at McDonald's now. They create those two lanes, and if, I don't know if y'all seen some altercations with trying to cut in front of people. I've seen two. Very strange, right? Because they're, they're trying to save those 45 seconds. But anyway, but let's say, aside from that, you know, imagine just paying for the car behind you. Five dollars, four dollars, you know, not a lot, or it could be a lot, but it's just something like that. Act of kindness is defined as something out of the ordinary. A, a little, a little, um, I don't want to say a little, a young, a young girl and her, I think she was 13 or 14, said, I do acts of kindness every week. I wash the dishes. And, uh, and her mom said, that's not an act of kindness, that's your job, that's your chore, that's your responsibility. Those are the things you have to do. Um, this is something above and beyond. This is different, right? And I promise you, I, don't, I, I can't get away with this, with this either. I know um, I was talking with Brianna earlier. Part of my role at cleaning the house is sweeping and cleaning the litter. 
That's not an act of kindness to anybody. That's, that's my role. That's my job. So what's something above and beyond that? But I promise you, whether it's you or your kid, it just feels different because we don't do it all the time. We don't do it every day. At least, at least most of us don't. Last two. I love this picture. Hope everybody online can see it. This is Grumpy Cat, right? Grumpy Cat says, what a beautiful day. Let's go back inside now, right? So my, um, my uncle used to date a, 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 a woman who reminded me of Grumpy Cat. Not how she looked, but how she behaved, right? Um, he always would tell me that no matter how beautiful the day was, she would always find that one cloud or that one um, or it's too windy or something. I'm sure all of you have friends like that. I know I know, I do. So the acronym here is Hunt the Good Stuff, HTGs. So minus the tragedies. And by tragedies in our lives, somebody dying, okay? Minus that, that's a different conversation. Minus that, imagine going to bed every night. And again, I try to do this, but it's not easy sometimes. It is not. Imagine going to bed every night and talking with your partner or kid. What's one good thing that happened today? I don't know. You know, sometimes um, I, I know I don't talk about that every day. I shared with you the example of what my wife shared with me, that horrible, sad image. A lot of times we go to bed thinking about the negative or what we're going to do tomorrow. But imagine asking two questions to your child. What's one good thing that happened today? How can you do more of that, those good things in the future? You're, we're retraining the mind to think differently. We're, we're, we're thinking about that one good thing that happened to us that day instead of the 15 bad things. Because, yeah, I, you know what? I'm, I'm with you. Probably most days there's more negative than positive. But the power is in thinking of that one positive thing. And look, I already said this twice, but I'll say it again sometimes. I mean, those of you who have parents, you know how three and a half year olds are. It's not as easy as take a bath, get dressed, get a book, come to bed, and let's read. <laughs> That's, it never works like that, especially with me. I'm not as assertive as my wife is, so I struggle a little more. So if somebody were to tell me, think about this in the middle of that, that's challenging. But after she goes to bed, then we can talk about the positive thing. And you know what? It's not easy. Let me share one story here. When I used to counsel um, adolescents, this was not easy for them. It, it was not. They had some, some tough times. And I'll never forget one kid. And I'm not the most assertive person, but I never, got, I never let people get away with telling me nothing. I never let them get away with that. So one kid finally said, after he had said nothing five times, I said, that's not good enough. He finally said, at least he has a roof over his head. And you know what? It sounds cliche. It sounds ha hallmark. But it's, it's not because that's still a positive thing. That is still a positive thing. I know what it's like um, through my grandparents' stories of worrying about not having a roof over your head, worrying about paying for food, about the light being turned off. So I've, re I've heard that vicariously. So with him, I wanted him to see that that's not a, a guaranteed thing for a lot of people. So for him, the roof over his head was a, a start. And he started thinking about at least that positive thing instead of all those negative. So remember, it's not ignoring the negative. It's just bringing other things in the conversation. So the last one, and I know I've, uh, even though I've said this like, I don't know, 10 or 12 times, it never gets easier. No, uh, I know Brianna's heard this story, but it's, it just never gets easier. Um, it really doesn't. So we know through research that expressing gratitude is a very powerful protector of depression and predictor of happiness. We know that. I also know, or I'm speculating, that not all adolescents express gratitude all the time. Somebody said about three weeks ago, somebody said, I express gratitude all the time to my parents. And then she shared that she expressed gratitude through text and lots of emojis. Okay, you know, that's a good start. That's better than nothing. But we're talking about gratitude is doing something different, right? Maybe writing a letter, 
maybe riding a car, drawing a picture, something different that's not what we're used to doing. So the story is how do I, how did I apply it? So I never, I, it took me a while um, to realize how sick my mom was, it just didn't connect with me. But about a week before she passed away, I wrote a gratitude letter to her. It was about three pages. It was tough to write, you can imagine, right? Um, one of my biggest regrets, and Brianna knows this, I didn't, um, I didn't read it to her. I had my grandma read it to her, which, you know, I don't know if I can say it. It's very, very cowardly. You know, I hate that. Biggest regret. I should have read it. So for, for us or for our kids, I would tell them, one, to, to, to write a letter, write a gratitude letter and express it to them. And two, I know writing, expressing gratitude sounds so easy, but it's, it's not. And here's why. When I got married, um, there, I wrote about 140 thank you cards. I, I really did. I didn't, say, I didn't send a Hallmark and then just um, say thank you, love Javier and Alyssa, right? I wrote a little personal message to everybody. But there were three gratitude letters I didn't write. One was to my mom, and two were to my cousin's brothers, who were like my brothers, my cousins. And I didn't write the gratitude letters because I knew thinking about the things I wanted to write would make me sad and, 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 and lose a little hope because I would, we would hang out all the time. They would spend the night with me. I, knew, I didn't want to say goodbye. That's what, that's what I'm saying. So this may sound so easy on paper, but it is not. Because when we express gratitude, we think about a wide range of experiences and, and emotions. But if you ever write a gratitude letter, I would, I would tell you to don't be like me. Give it to the, give it to the person. Now, the last point I want to say about this, I've never done this, but one of my goals as a college professor is to assign this task. There's one class where I ask my students to write a gratitude letter to somebody who they appreciate. I, I've done that. What I haven't done and what I want to do is for my students to invite the recipient of those letters to my class and my students read the letters to, to those recipients. I just imagine that that would be one of the most powerful experiences. I haven't done it. I don't have a good reason for why I haven't done it. Maybe because how I might feel in that experience. I don't know. Um, but that's my goal, and I hope you see how much I value that um, in terms of happiness and depression. All right, so the last one, maybe like um, one minute, right? One minute, then we'll share our closing remarks. You see this image of application. We talked about depression. We talked about eight strategies for happiness. If you can think to yourself, how do you think you can apply this to your life or to your kid's life? It could be as simple as, oh, I'm going to help them express gratitude or something. Just how can you apply it to your, to your life? Just one minute, and we'll sh close up. So just a couple of final thoughts. No, first, thank you. Um, my way of expressing gratitude to you all is just to say thank you for your attention, your engagement. Um, those people on, online as well, thank you for, for being here. Um, the people in the room, I definitely felt you were engaged 100%. And I don't feel that all the time. Uh, I want to be honest with that uh, and to point out that Y'all really showed that you cared about the, the conversation. Um, the second one, I'm not an expert on this. I struggle with these, these things every day. But I assure you that the things up here are based on research. And they need to become habitual. 
They need to become part of our, our practice. Number three, I try to be honest and transparent with you all as parents. What I don't like is speakers who come up here and talk about how this is so easy. It's not. It is not easy. It, it is hard. I would say trying to be happy is, is very, very difficult. It sounds easy. sounds like Hallmark, but it's not. It's not easy to go to bed thinking about that one positive thing when you're in the middle of a crisis. Right? It's not easy. It is, it is very hard. Um, but these things, just, just to be mindful. And the last one, if I had to pick one of the eight that I would do tonight, which I'm going to do, how do I apply this to my life? I'm going to go and I'm going to go and do hunt the good stuff to me. That's all I'm going to go do with my daughter tonight. Um, there's some things at work that are a little challenging in terms of the amount of work. Love my job, but just the amount. But I'm going to try to ignore all that, or not ignore all that, put it aside for that time when I read to her and just just hunt the good stuff with her on that night. Um, and the last thing, just, just thank y'all uh, again. Thank you very much.